Hey, well, good morning. So good to be able to join with you this morning and privileged to share God's Word. How are you guys doing? I hope you're doing all right and staying safe out there. Hey, um, how many of you love secret agent movies? You know, I, I kind of grew up watching James Bond and I love the gadgets and the cars. And I remember watching uh, one of the movies where they had the Lotus Esprit, that latest sports car back then. It was pursued by a helicopter and run off a pier where it plunged into the ocean. And I was thinking, oh, it's a goner. I mean, what a, what a waste of a lovely car. And then it turns into a submarine. Oh my goodness, I was just so totally blown away, right? Um, God's called us to be a different kind of secret agent this morning. Uh, it's a secret, being a secret agent of change. And the agent of change is the kingdom of God. Yes, it is. Now, I used to be a, uh, well, I still am a part-time substitute teacher, but really no time at all nowadays. Uh, but before the pandemic, I would possibly teach like once or twice a week. And the students would get to know me. Well, last week when I was running my dog, or the other way around, uh, one, uh, a car sped past me with a bunch of uh, boys in it, uh, now probably adult boys, and they, uh, they yelled my name, Hey, Mr. Chow, how's it going? Gave me, giving me the shaka, and I gave them a shaka, and I was like, I have no clue who those boys were, right? I just don't remember them as much as maybe they do recall who I was. And it made me think, I must have made some kind of impression upon them. Hopefully it was a positive impression, right? Uh, for them to remember me. And I want to encourage you this morning that uh, you do make an impression on others. Right? Whether you feel like you're mediocre or you're unimpressionable, you actually can make an impact on other people's lives. You'll be surprised. Okay? And so that's what we want to talk about this morning in the in, uh, the series that we're in called Kingdom Come. We want to talk about the kingdom of God in our lives uh, in the parable of the yeast. But before we get into that, uh, Jesus here describes uh, para uh, kingdom principles using parables. And his disciples were asking him, why are you using parables? Why, why do you speak to us in parables? And his reply in Matthew chapter 13, if you have your Bibles or your Bible app, you can click on Matthew 13. And verse 11 says, he replied, Because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Yeah, it has been given to you. You who are my children, you who are my disciples, you who are believers, it's been given to you. You who understand, you who believe, you who perceive the deep things of God, it's been given to you because you will understand it. Right? Versus... The ones who don't understand, but not them. Them being maybe the callous, the crowds, or even the clueless. Yeah. Now I came across this Instagram post by Pastor Danny Silk. It's called the five deadly terms used by a woman. Let's have some fun here. Okay, here we go. First word, fine. This is the word women use to end an argument when she knows she's right and you need to stop talking. Second, nothing. It means something and you should be worried. Go ahead. Do not confuse this with permission. It's a dare and don't even think about it. Okay, whatever. It's a woman's way of calling you Lolo, okay? Number five, that's okay. She's thinking long and hard on how and when you will pay for your mistakes. And this is a bonus word. Wow. This is not a compliment. She is amazed that one person could be so clueless. Yes, when it comes to our relationship with God, I hope we're not going to be clueless, right? Like possibly a husband or a boyfriend. Because if there's any passage that we can wrap our heads and our hearts around, uh, it is the parables that Jesus taught because they are the secrets of the kingdom of God uh, given only exclusively for the understanding of the believer, right? 
And so this is really important for us to get it while others don't. So let's, let's look at today's parable, which is the parable of the yeast found in Matthew chapter 13, verse 33. And we read here, Jesus also used this illustration. The kingdom of heaven is like the yeast a woman used in making bread. Even though she, puts, she put only a little yeast in three measures of flour, it permeated every part of the dough. Now, there are two different schools of thought here. One group of scholars believe that since yeast is often referred to sin in the Bible, uh, this must be a reference to sin, where we can, yeah, I can see how that would work as well, where sin, if you allow sin to fester uh, in our bodies, and in our hearts, and our souls, and if we don't nip it in the bud, as soon as possible, what's going to happen is it's going to uh, expand and it will rear its ugly head one day, right? And so, yes, we could, I could see it that way. However, Jesus is pretty clear that he's talking about the kingdom of God and its growth in this uh, parable. And one of the reasons is in Luke chapter 13, where we find a parallel uh, version of Matthew's uh, this verse 33 version. Uh, in Luke's version, uh, there's a twin reference of the parable of the mustard seed and how it grows from a little tiny seed into the large tree. And then Jesus says this in verse 20, which is right after the parable, he, exp uh, he shares about the parable of the mustard seed. He says, he also asked, what else is the kingdom of God like, right? What else? And then he shares the parable of the mustard, uh, the yeast, I mean. And so there's a, there's a connection there where Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God and how it is uh, the driving force that permeates into all of society, just like yeast is. So let's get into what yeast is. Yes, yeast is that driving force that, uh, that causes fermentation, that magical process uh, allowing a dense mass of dough to become a well risen loaf of bread, right? So that's what yeast does. It's the force behind fermentation. Now, there are four things that we can learn from this, uh, this parable. And the first thing, number one, is this. God's kingdom may begin small, but it will increase with contact. So where do we begin? Let's start small. Right? Look at yeast. It's so fine. It's so tiny. Yet it has such a multiplying effect. So let's begin small and begin with ourselves. You see, yeast multiplies as it feeds on sugar. So we do the same. We multiply as we feed on God's word, on God's presence, on God's love, grace, and mercy. And as He fills us with His fullness, we in turn are able to share that love and fullness uh, with those around us. Amen? Let's start small. But some of us like to begin large, right? We have grandiose ideas such as uh, uh, establishing a food program, right? Or uh, running a large, exciting, vibrant ministry, or building an orphanage. Uh, maybe try foster care first, or adopt a child, or get your foot in the door uh, of an establishment you want to be a part of. Or instead of trying to get a, a large ministry, run a Bible study first. Right? These are some things that we can do uh, for God to cause the kingdom of God to increase and multiply and grow. Amen? Um, in fact, look at verse 33. Here, she put only a little yeast into three measures of flour, right? You might think, oh, yeah, nothing, three measures of flour. Actually, three measures of flour is between 40 to 60 pounds of that stuff. Imagine how much that is, 40 to 60 pounds, and only a tiny little bit of yeast allows the 40 to 60 pounds of dough to expand and multiply into a well-rounded, well-risen 
loaf of bread that could probably feed several families, if not a small community, right? And so, begin with one step of obedience, one expression of love. Take a spot to serve Him, right? Care for one person at a time and see where God takes you from there. Amen? You know, we don't hear about Jesus' uh, ministry in the temple as much. And I believe there's a reason why. You know, He did uh, teach at the temple every day. But what is found in the Bible is His one-on-one -on -one ministry with people, right? Yes, uh, the Sermon on the Mount was recorded, but I don't see any other sermons. Yet, He hung out with His disciples. He taught them. He shared with them. Uh, he went to those who were unfortunate. He went to those who uh, were sick and needed healing. He cared for individual people. And I believe that's where He wants us to begin. Right? Matthew 25, 40 says, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Right? In John Revere's book, Drawing Near, which my life group is going through, John uh, uh, points out a very interesting uh, observation uh, in the passage Mark chapter 5. Let me give you a background. <clears throat> Here, Jesus was tired of doing ministry. I mean, not tired of. He was tired from doing ministry, I mean. And the Holy Spirit led him into a boat with his disciples to go across the Sea of Galilee. And on the way there, they were met with the storm. Uh, you might remember this, where Jesus was uh, laying down, sleeping, and the disciples were really afraid and woke Jesus up and asked Jesus, Hey, Jesus, you got to do something about this, right? And so Jesus woke up and rebuked the wind and the waves and said, You have little faith. Remember that? Now, when they got immediately to the other side, they were met by a demon-possessed person whom Jesus healed after. Now, the description of this demon-possessed person is what I want to get into as we read Mark 5, verses 3 to 5. All right, let's go. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, and he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day, among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. Right, now this is not an ordinary guy that you want to hang out with. You don't want to mess with this guy. He is so strong that he's able to break those chains, those iron clasps on his feet and on, on his wrists, right? And uh, if he was living today, he would have been placed in a mental institution, probably in solitary confinement. He would have been given drugs to subdue him because of all his cries and all his shrieks and, and wailing and, and cutting himself. I mean, someone had to protect him, right? Um, he would be a worthless drain on society, truly. Uh, and his value would be next to nothing. Yet, Jesus saw him as valuable. That he risked his life and his disciples' life in a storm from one end of the Sea of Galilee unto the other side to meet with this one guy and heal him. You might say, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm, I'm sure Jesus had other ministry to do on this side of the lake. Actually, if you look at verse 21 and right before that, it says that after Jesus cast out the demon from this person and healed him, this person wanted to, to go with Jesus. And Jesus said, sorry, not this time around. And then he got into the boat again. And verse 21 says, When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. In other words, as soon as this person was healed, he got into a boat and he went back onto the other side of the lake. Which means to say this was the only person he met with and healed. You know, there's no large speaking engagement. And as he started small, check this out. In Mark chapter 5, if you read that passage, 
uh, you will realize that this man who was healed uh, went on to share his encounter with Jesus and the testimony of his healing uh, to the Decapolis. Now the Decapolis is a conglomerate of 10 cities. So one person who was ministered to ended up affecting an entire region, 10 cities with the gospel. How awesome is that, right? See, that is the increase of the kingdom of God. You know, when we insert ourselves into society, when we share of God's love for us. So what, what would it look like if God told us to do the simple little things and we went ahead and did it? What would it look like if we obeyed what He was calling us to do even if it was inconvenient? What would it look like if we started small and remained faithful? Amen? Now, number two, God's kingdom exerts its influence from within. Let's look at Luke chapter 17, verses 20 to 21. Now, when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, See here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. Once again, you carry the kingdom of God in you. Yes. Say, I carry the kingdom. Yeah, I carry the kingdom. And as the yeast works secretly in a patch of dough to cause it to rise and expand and grow, you can be that secret agent that God has called you to be. And you can secretly insert yourself into the lives of others, loving them, caring for them, standing with them. I remember when my daughter first came into our family at 10 years old, she was actually previously adopted by a family on Maui where after two years, they decided that they couldn't care for her any longer and so they gave her up and we took her in. But you can imagine she was rejected by her biological family, by that family on Maui, and then she comes into our family and we tell her, hey, you know, we want to adopt you and we want to be your forever family. You're right, right? That's what she probably was thinking back then. And I don't blame her for that because of the trauma that she endured, that she went through, right? So it was rough for us and for her as well. And she would say things like, I don't want to live here. I hate this family. Yeah, she would say things like that. And sometimes love says you have to just persevere through those things. Love is patient. Love is kind, all right? And so uh, little by little, little that love like a yeast in the dough began to permeate her being and little by little she started accepting the leaven of love that we were giving to her and that love grew from within and now I believe she's very secure in uh, her love for God and her love for uh, this family that this family has for her and um, uh, the other, there was one time where uh, she's usually very reserved and quiet, but she told um, my youngest son in front of all of us, he, she, she said, Hey, Jonathan, you know we have good parents. Uh, you better not take them for granted, you know. <laughs> Chio, me, and I looked at each other. It was like, wow, where did, where did that come from? <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I just love her. She's truly my, my daughter, right? Daddy's girl. Anyway. Uh, yeah, so do that with your children. Do that with your friends. Do that with your loved ones. And number three, the kingdom of God is comprehensive. Ever throw in a brand new red pair of socks into uh, a wash of white? Yeah, <laughs> that's not a good idea. Uh, that's why my wife doesn't really want me to do laundry because I just throw in any kind and mix it all together, right? And she's like, no, you cannot do that. I'm like, ah, uh, you know. Um, but what happens to the white clothes? Not just one white shirt turning pink, right? The whole batch would turn pink after that red sock uh, bleeds out, yeah? In the same way, the blood of Christ bleeds out within our lives and his sanctification 
uh, in us would be complete, would be uh, comprehensive, and that comprehensive work from within again spreads out to those around us. In verse 33 again it says the yeast it permeated every part of the dough, right? Not just one part uh, on the left side, on the right side, every part of the dough was permeated with that yeast. You know some of us may feel discouraged. We wonder is God there, right? Can I catch a break in life? Maybe it has to do with our finances or our relationships or our status or, or where we are in at life and we wonder is, is God even working in me and through me? You know, stay the course. He is. He is. His work is comprehensive for your life. Partner with Him, you know. And sometimes you wonder if a loved one will ever come to Christ, right? Or if a loved one would ever change his or her ways. And you know, it's been a while that you've been praying for this person, that you've been loving on this person, and starting to get really tiring. Yeah, I, I know where you're coming from. And you wonder, uh, is, is there actually going to be any change? Because we've been doing this, right, for years. We've been doing this for years, and yet we don't see any progress. You know, keep at it. Don't give up. Even if your love is waning, God's love for them is still completely full. And God's love for them is, is still working its way into their hearts and into their lives. You know, the other day, I was decluttering, uh, cleaning out my room, and I found this piece of paper, a, a note that was written by Chiomi before we got married. It was, uh, you know, reasons why she wanted to marry me, right? And it's not just 10 reasons. It was a list of 100 reasons why she thought I was a good catch. I know, right? You know, uh, you know. yeah, my, my head was getting really large like a puffer fish. But then God shot me down right after. He, uh, like the next morning, I read Psalm 139, 17 to 18, which says this. David says, how precious are your thoughts about me, O God? They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. And when I wake up, you are still with me. I felt God say to me, okay, so you think a hundred reasons is impressive uh, regarding uh, your, your wife loving you? How about me loving you, Terrence? Uh, how about an innumerable number of reasons of how much I think of you and of how much I love you? And I go, You know, no human love or human relationship can ever compare or compete with the kind of love that God has for us, that God has for you. Yeah, He loves you immensely, innumerably, immeasurably, inconceivably. He loves you so much. And sometimes you think, you might think you are, you are uh, the answer. No, Jesus is the answer. God will continue loving that person that whom you care for more than you can even ask or think. And so, uh, be assured, He will do more than His part. Okay, number four. God's kingdom works invisibly, but its effect is evident to all. Look around you. It's the evidence of transformed lives. Your loved ones who belong to Him, wow, they look good, right? They even smell good, like a loaf of risen bread coming right out of the oven. Wow! Ah. But we forget that you and I, who are transformed, were once a piece, a lump of dough, right? It escapes our mind that all of us had a beginning at one point, and some of us, our beginning was not pretty, right? It was rough. In fact, we're still rough around the edges. We have to remember that there are those out there who are not in our position yet, 
who don't show the evidence of his kingdom in their lives yet. However, God does work invisibly in them still, in you as well as in them. And we have to not lose heart. I remember uh, my friend was sharing uh, how she and, and the kids would go to church every Sunday and her husband would refuse to. And uh, she would return each Sunday with uh, cassette tape. How many of you guys know what a cassette tape is? Yeah, here's a picture of it. But she would, um, she would bring home a cassette tape of the sermon and leave it on his dresser, right? Each and every Sunday. And for over a year, she would do that. And for over a year, a uh, cassette tape that was left there would not be touched or be moved at all. It's just right there at the same place. Right? Of course, she would remove it and put a new one there. But little did she know that every Sunday, while she was gone with the kids, he would take that cassette tape and listen to the message and then rewind it and put it back. Right? Until one day, he, he told her, he asked her, hey, can I come with you to church? And she was floored. I mean, she was like, where, did, where is this coming from? Yeah? And then the Sunday after, he gave his life to the Lord, and now they're running a successful marriage ministry. I, share that, I might have shared that story before, but it, it's close to my heart because it shows the invisible nature of the kingdom of God working within a person. And now we see the evidence and we always forget and we always don't realize at one point they were not there yet. I want to close this time with Philippians chapter 1, 6 as we read the scripture verse. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. You know, we just talked about how God works invisibly. And I want to reiterate that last point in closing. Uh, the other uh, week, I prayed over uh, one of my teammates uh, during soccer. He, he, he went down with a really serious knee injury to a point where he couldn't walk, he couldn't stand, and uh, he had to be carted off. But before he was carted off, I prayed healing upon that knee. And uh, I told him, hey, let's, let's just pray that God can heal this. And 20 minutes later, I saw him walking on the sideline. And I was blown away. I was amazed. And I believe God healed him. But even if God did it, let's say, let's say he wasn't healed, right? You see, we don't know what God is trying to do in a person's life. We can just be obedient, right? I went in with the mindset uh, that God wants to heal him, right? And so I prayed that specifically from that mindset. However, God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. And we don't know if God wants to accomplish something far greater in his life, where in a future situation, everything will merge together and he will come to a point where he believes in his, in his heart and shares wondrous and great testimonies of what God has done in his life, right? And so I can't just stop there. I just have to remain faithful. I just have to be that yeast, that tiny yeast being inserted into the lives uh, of our loved ones, of our family, of our community, of our teammates, of our co-workers, of our fellow students, that we would just be faithful in the little. And then God will carry it through all the way to the end, right? Unto completion, as Philippians 1.6 says. And I want to say this as Paul says this being confident of this in the beginning part of that scripture we ought to have confidence as we bring confidence into the situations that God puts us in it breeds hope it breeds vision it breeds life and so be encouraged be that kingdom of God be that secret agent that God has called you to be amen all right let's pray let's pray let's bow our heads father God the world is going through so much, Lord Jesus, right now. People are facing heartaches, they're facing fears, they're facing uncertainty. And you are the only one who is certain. You are the one who knows it all. And Father, allow us to operate 
in your kingdom. Uh, allow us to treasure those one steps of faith, those tiny bits of, of uh, reaching out to others because we know we can be like that yeast when inserted into society, inserted into our families, inserted into our community and workplaces. We can make a huge difference whether we know or understand or realize it. Because your kingdom, your kingdom, your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So in Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. Amen. Thanks for watching guys. God bless.